It is an immeasurable privilege to deliver a keynote address at a World Federation of Occupational Therapists Congress, and especially to have the honor of doing so at the first such Congress ever to be held on African soil. I am sincerely grateful to the WFOT 2018 Organizing Committee and the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists for this extraordinary opportunity. My lecture today is informed by the inspired theme chosen for this Congress, connected in diversity, positioned for impact. I shall refer to some of the issues arising from the lack of diversity reflected in occupational therapies, dominant theories and models, and the practices they inform. Shall explore some specific values embedded in these ways of thinking about humans and occupations, and shall endeavor to suggest how things might be different and why things will have to be different if occupational therapy is to be positioned to have a globally relevant impact in the future. Because I wish to consider issues of diversity, I shall begin by noting that the high income areas of the world that are often designated Western or sometimes Northern constitute less than 20% of the global population. So this is, statistically speaking, the minority world. The middle and low income countries of the South and East are home to over 80% of the global population and are most accurately termed the majority world. The terms North-South and West-East that I shall use throughout this lecture are not geographically precise, but are used by social theorists to indicate the enduring pattern of inequality in power, wealth, and cultural influence that has grown out of European colonialism and North American imperialism. The occupational therapy profession evolved in North America and the United Kingdom in the early part of the 20th century and spread across the world over the course of the next 100 years. Many of the first occupational therapy students from countries of the global South and East were educated in the USA or UK and returned to develop occupational therapy programs and services in their home countries, encultured by theories and inspired by practices that had arisen within contexts very different from their own, a pattern that continues. This process of enculturation, coupled with the supremacy of the English language in occupational therapy journals and books, has contributed to the global dominance of ideas originating in North America, Australasia, and Britain. Ideas which must somehow be translated and made to fit within the majority world context to which they are exported. Occupational therapists draw from specific theories about human occupation and its connection to health and well being to inform their practices. Our theories and conceptual models encapsulate our unique body of knowledge and beliefs about occupation and are the organizing principles that underpin our actions. All theories are inevitably value laden because theorists formulate their ideas within specific social, political, and historical contexts. Medical researchers and basic scientists have sought to expose the ethnocentric bias within science that results from the assumption that the ways Europeans and North Americans think and view reality are universally valid. And they have drawn attention to the ways in which specific cultural templates have spawned value-based and culturally loaded theories. For example, Critical scholars have noted that 96% of the people studied in international psychology research are drawn from Western industrialized democracies that comprise just 12% of the global population. 
and they contend that researchers are ill-advised to make any generalizations about human nature or behavior on the basis of data derived from such a thin and unrepresentative slice of humanity. Similar concerns have been raised by critical disability theorists who have pointed out that the vast majority of research contributing to our understanding of disability derives from comparatively privileged urban regions of Western Europe and North America, yet at least 80% of the planet's disabled people live in the global south. Most live in rural areas, and a high proportion endure severe levels of poverty and social marginalization. Some occupational scientists have raised similar concerns, noting that adult, middle-class, non-disabled, white, anglophone women living in the Western world have been most frequently studied by researchers, such that the preponderance of research evidence within occupational science derives from the small subsection of the global population that most closely matches the demographics of the majority of occupational scientists. This unrepresentative, distorted, and partial evidence base informs and reinforces various theories that influence both occupational science and occupational therapy, yet reflects the reality and experiences of only a tiny proportion of the global population. Critical scholars within the social sciences have contested the way northern theory, which embeds the viewpoints, perspectives, and problems of northern Europe and North America's urban societies, is presented as universally relevant knowledge, despite excluding the experiences and thoughts of the overwhelming majority of the world's population. Unfortunately, Theorists rarely refer to the uniqueness of their specific viewpoints, as if this does not matter. But the failure to recognize northern theory as inevitably culturally embedded and inherently culturally specific results in major inadequacies, with partial insights being misleadingly presented as if they constitute universal principles. Clearly, the ideas encapsulated within occupational therapy's dominant theories and models did not fall fully formed from the heavens, but arose from the experiences, perspectives, and reflections that derived from the specific positions of various theorists. It is essential to recognize that theorists' positioning is integral to the shaping of theory and that from a particular perspective, one can see some things more clearly than others. If I go outside this conference center and stand on Walter Sisulu Avenue, I shall be able to see certain dimensions of Cape Town and shall thus formulate some impressions of the city. If instead I climb Table Mountain, I shall be unable to see those specific aspects of the particular corner of Cape Town that I can see from here, but shall be able to see other dimensions of the city, such as its scale and its relationship to the ocean, which will contribute to a different understanding of the nature and character of Cape Town. And this is true not solely for my geographic location, but also for my social location. From my particular position or social standpoint as a citizen of both Canada and the European Union, a heterosexual of a specific gender and age, and a member of both a privileged race and social class, I am able to see some things more clearly than others. In fact, because of my ultra-privileged social location, there are many dimensions of global human experience that I am unable to see at all. Occupational therapies, most influential theorists have shared very similar privileged social positions as well-educated, urban, 
middle class, middle aged, able bodied, white Anglophones, usually with Judeo Christian cultural backgrounds. Positions that differentiate them from the majority of the world's people, and even from most of the people in our own minority world. And this is why multiple perspectives are essential in formulating a comprehensive understanding of complex human issues, such as occupational participation. In the recent past, the theoretical dominance of the Anglophone minority within the global occupational therapy profession was rarely challenged, and the specific cultural assumptions that informed dominant occupational therapy theories and models were neither exposed nor explored. Inevitably, this contributed to the illusion that certain models and theories of occupation had achieved international dominance because they were evidence-informed, universally relevant, and somehow correct or true. More recently, however, a few critical thinkers have begun to challenge occupational therapy's dominant Western assumptions about occupation, health, and well-being, and the culturally specific theories and practices that have been informed by these assumptions. Philosophers have noted that when dominant groups fail to recognize their perspectives as perspectives, they not only present their experiences, values, and perspectives as universal, but also as somehow neutral and objective. Yet critical thinkers contend that neutrality and objectivity are misleading illusions that are only ever claimed by those in positions of racial, class, and colonial privilege. When theorists are positioned as privileged members of a dominant population, as we almost inevitably are, our theories and models tend to be informed by the unquestioned common sense ideas, values, social norms, and unchallenged ideologies that are hegemonic within our corner of the minority world. An ideology is a system of ideas, beliefs, and assumptions that operates below one's level of conscious awareness and by being taken for granted, appears to constitute normal common sense. One of the most pervasive and pernicious influences on occupational therapies underlying assumptions and consequent practices is the ideology of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism does not refer to liberal political parties or to their specific philosophies or policies, but to an ideology or way of thinking that originated in the United States and United Kingdom in the late 1970s and early 1980s, dominated the global north in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, and has swept across the world like a vast tidal wave. Neoliberalism is generally described as a political ideology, a mode of governance, and an approach to policy that aims to advance the market as the most efficient mechanism for organizing virtually all aspects of human social life. <clears throat> Implementing a neoliberal agenda entails, among other measures, cutting taxes, reducing government spending on health and social services, and slashing regulations to foster a social, legal, and political environment that is favorable to private business. Congruent with this agenda, neoliberalism extols individualism, embraces individual freedom and self-interest, espouses individual choice and responsibility, promotes independence and self-reliance, and advances productivism in which people are only worth what they produce. Thus, neoliberalism has effectively eroded a sense of collective responsibility for the well-being of others, and has suppressed any recognition that individuals' achievements are contingent upon both the support of families and communities, and on economic and social policies and positioning. 
effectively obscured within neoliberal discourse is the reality that privilege is more likely to accrue on the basis of the racial and class groups to which people belong than by merit of their individual abilities. There can be no doubt that neoliberalism has been remarkably successful in generating economic and social benefits for those already in positions of privilege in the global north and among elite classes in the global south. But many critics believe that the expanding gulf of inequality in those countries where neoliberalism has been either embraced or imposed is a direct and inevitable consequence of policies that have created unequal access to opportunities and that by reducing taxes on the wealthiest members of society have increased the cost of services to disabled people and others at the bottom of the socioeconomic hierarchy. Importantly, it is only when we understand that social inequalities are human creations designed to benefit a few, that we can see the possibilities for challenging inequality. Political scientists contend that neoliberalism exerts pervasive effects on ways of thinking and acting to the point where it has become incorporated into the common sense way we interpret, live in, and understand the world. Ways of thinking that are perceived as common sense are singularly resistant to change and exhibit a remarkable ability to survive contact with contesting evidence. And it is not difficult to discern the impact of neoliberal values of productivity and modes of governance, such as individualized work plans and quantitative outcome monitoring on occupational therapies, dominant models of occupation, standardized methods of assessment, individualized modes of intervention, and allegiance to quantitative outcome measurement. Indeed, our profession upholds and advances a neoliberal agenda when Contrary to our profession's codes of ethics, we promote models of service delivery that provide occupational therapy on the basis not of need, but of the ability to pay. When we develop and promote self-management programs without challenging the premise that health results solely from individual behaviors, when we uphold ideologies that separate individuals from their environments and accordingly seek individualized solutions to problems originating in inequitable social structures. When we focus on the enhancement of self-care skills, regardless of the value of self-care to clients. When we prioritize occupations, we can label productivity and when we adopt the client-centered language of consumerism to infer choice when often none exists. This is not to suggest that all these practices are inherently detrimental to the public good, but to highlight their congruence with a specific neoliberal ideology that occupational therapists rarely name and seldom challenge but that has left a discernible imprint on our theories and practices. The occupational therapy profession in the West has enthusiastically endorsed, promoted, and exported the neoliberal message that independence is admirable, aspirational, and universally valued. And research evidence supports the premise that to some people, self-care independence is profoundly important. But the available evidence also indicates that self-care independence is not valued by everyone everywhere. That many disabled people gladly delegate tasks to conserve time and energy for valued occupations and that many people appreciate the opportunity to accept assistance from others. So it should not be surprising that critical disability theorists 
perceive occupational therapists' ideology of self-reliance and independence to be disempowering, out of step with disabled people's needs, and as effectively reinforcing neoliberal cultural stereotypes that demean and devalue those who are unable to achieve independence, who choose to accept assistance, or who prefer to adopt a more cooperative and collaborative approach to accomplishing their daily life activities. In reality, evidence indicates that the majority of the global population assign a higher priority to interdependence than to independence, that their self-worth derives from fulfilling their responsibilities in contributing to the well-being of family members, clans, and communities, and that they neither devalue dependence nor view it as inherently problematic or in need of therapeutic remediation. Indeed, independence is an alien concept in some cultural contexts. For example, the African concepts Ubuntu and Unhu and the Inca principle of Aini teach that individuals are not separate and independent, but inherently constituted by their cooperative relationships with others, such that the well-being of the individual and others are interwoven. Many of the world's people choose to engage in communal and cooperative occupations because they afford opportunities for interdependence. And attaining social harmony may be a higher priority for many people than achieving independence. Within some cultures, those who strive for independence and self-fulfillment are regarded as immature. And researchers who have explored a diversity of worldviews have reported that the aim of the most important occupations is interdependence. Even within Western societies, the value placed on independence is demonstrably class-based. Although highly educated, North Americans do apparently value independence and individual-centered occupations. Many working class people are embedded in tightly structured social networks and exhibit greater interdependence than those in the middle classes. Moreover, researchers report that interdependence and mutual obligation are especially important in contexts where individual well-being depends on the ability to tap into collective resources, such that people who are poor are frequently born into and enveloped within networks of families, relatives, friends and neighbors, relying heavily on these for the exchange of food, money, labor and information. Not only is the evidence base to support the wholesale promotion of independence rather flimsy, but the available evidence appears to point in the opposite direction, with research indicating that interdependence inoculates people against loneliness, which is a risk factor for dementia, stroke, coronary heart disease, and mortality. Indeed, even in Western nations, a sense of connectedness and belonging is shown to be integral to mental health. Unfortunately, Western neoliberal ideologies of independence and individualism are reified in our profession's dominant models of occupation, which portray all occupations as divisible into three categories, activities of daily living, work, and play, or self-care productivity and leisure categories that specifically focus on the self-interests, self-care independence, and self-fulfillment of individuals. Many critics have expressed concerns about the lack of supportive evidence for these specific categories, noting that these are inapplicable across the lifespan, devoid of context, simplistic, individualistic, exclusionary, value-laden, culturally specific, artificially restrictive and potentially culturally unsafe. And they have cautioned against imposing conceptual frameworks such as these that may not reflect the worldviews and values of clients. Clearly, 
the occupational therapy concept of productivity, which equates personal wealth, worth with productive achievement, is directly derived from the values of neoliberalism. Moreover, the assumption that leisure and work are distinct and divisible concepts is specific to urban communities in the Western world. Evidence indicates that the concept of leisure is an ethnocentric, ableist, and class-bound concept for which the languages of many people do not have an equivalent word. And the occupational therapy concept of self-care, which frequently focuses rather narrowly on independence in such activities as toileting, bathing, dressing, and feeding, has obscured the importance of doing for survival that is a fundamental concern to those people enduring severe environmental challenges, economic and political instability, military occupation, conflict and war, forced displacement, homelessness and deep poverty, and whose waking hours are consumed by desperate struggles to secure the sustenance of families and to survive. Even in North America, many disabled people and others facing precarious economic circumstances expend inordinate time and effort in identifying and obtaining the income supplements, goods, and services required to meet basic survival and self-care needs, not solely for themselves, but for their children and families. These resource-seeking occupations often overlooked by middle-class Western theorists, constitute the principal daily concern for many of the world's people, including so many in resource-rich nations in Western Europe and North America. Neoliberal ideologies are also detectable in occupational therapists' oft-repeated assertion that individuals choose, shape, and orchestrate their everyday occupations, as if choices are always made by individuals and never by couples, families, clans, or communities, and as if choice is simply a consequence of individual volition. This is a uniquely privileged assumption. Research demonstrates that the opportunity for occupational choice is inequitably distributed that occupations may be co-opted, coerced, or compelled, and that many people simply do what needs to be done, that choices may be severely constrained by structural inequalities, such as poverty and racism, by class and caste-based exploitation, and by oppressive and unjust religious and cultural traditions. In all parts of the world, including North America and Europe, many millions of women and girls are oppressed by patriarchy, misogyny, and violence, and their everyday occupations are chosen, shaped, and orchestrated by men. In some regions of desperate poverty, children as young as eight are denied their human right to an education and compelled to work in leather tanneries in which they are exposed to a toxic cocktail of chemicals that will almost certainly shorten their lives. In 2017, it was estimated that at least 21 million people around the world were in some form of slavery, including over a million victims of sex trafficking. And the occupations of begging, prostitution, and theft may be the only available options for those in desperate dehumanizing poverty, those who have no choice. Moreover, choices are made within the confining repertoires of cultural templates or scripts that shape the expectations and frame the life possibilities available to a member of a specific group or culture. And thus the choices or occupational possibilities that people are able to envision and to make. Indeed, the capability to choose, shape, and orchestrate one's occupations is not a universal norm, 
but a marker of privilege. I hope this very brief critique of some of the assumptions and assertions that underpin our profession's dominant theories and conceptual models indicates why I believe we need to build a more relevant and inclusive theoretical base from the strength of our diversity. But how might this be accomplished? Mathematicians use triangulation to determine the location of a point using geometry. And social scientists seeking to explain the complexity of human action have adopted the principle of triangulation to cross-check qualitative data from multiple research sources and derived from more than one standpoint. If, as occupational therapists, we drew from the strength of our diversity and the multiple perspectives that derive from our diverse standpoints, we could triangulate our knowledge and identify what is overlooked, obscured, or omitted when, for example, we delineate the purposes of all human occupations into just three categories of self-care, productivity, and leisure that have been prioritized by privileged Western theorists, or when we simplistically portray occupational participation as the product of individual ability and unconstrained choice. Such triangulation might incorporate Western knowledge, but in addition to Eastern, Southern, and indigenous perspectives, to include, for example, the knowledge of many African, Asian, Central and South American, Pacific Island, Southern European, and Middle Eastern peoples, and the indigenous peoples of North America, Australia, and Aotearoa who value engagement in specific occupations that enable them to contribute to others, to care for others, and to connect with others. And this might help us to recognize that these occupations are also important to many people in Western Europe and North America. This insight is supported by research indicating that belongingness is necessary for effective human functioning and well-being and is important both cross-developmentally, meaning that this applies to people of all ages, and cross-culturally, implying that this applies to all humans. It is possible to overlook these important occupations when we identify occupational categories from a single privileged standpoint, instead of triangulating the knowledge of a plurality of our profession's members, whose diversity derives not solely from our geographic locations, our languages, religious and cultural traditions, races, ethnicities, and experiences of colonialism and imperialism, but from our different gender identities, sexual orientations, ages, and disabilities, our location in urban and rural communities, and our different political and economic contexts. Thus, for example, instead of occupational therapists promoting the specifically Judeo-Christian notion of human superiority and entitlement to mastery over the environment, an ideology that legitimizes occupational behaviors that have caused cataclysmic degradation of our planet's resources, Occupational therapist theorists might respect the knowledge of rural people, hunter-gatherers, herders, and farmers, and of many Eastern peoples who seek through their occupations to achieve balance and harmony with the natural world of which they understand themselves to be inseparable. And our theorists might respect the knowledge of indigenous people in Australia, Otiroa, Hawaii, and Canada's Arctic regions, who recognize that their health and well-being hinges on their cap capability to engage in occupations through which they can care for their land as they care for other family members. And through triangulating our perspectives, we might also respect the knowledge of the multitude of people for whom religion infuses all aspects of daily life 
such that a central purpose of occupational engagement is to uphold, enact, celebrate, connect with, and transmit cultural and spiritual traditions. And we might respect the values of many cultural groups who engage in specific occupations with the purpose of honoring and respecting their ancestors. It is notable that these and so many other fundamentally important human occupations have been devalued and obscured because they cannot reasonably be labeled self-care, productivity, or leisure, or as daily living, work, or play. and thus fall outside the parameters of our profession's dominant conceptual models. Clearly, this has repercussions for the relevance of the occupational therapy practices that are informed by these culturally specific and artificially restrictive ways of conceptualizing and prioritizing occupations. By triangulating our standpoints, and building occupational theory from the strength of our diversity, occupational therapists might gain awareness of the cultural roots of our own assumptions and begin to identify and incorporate perspectives that have been missed, such as the importance of survival occupations, of occupations that contribute to the care and well being of our families and communities, and that strengthen social roles occupations or co-occupations that are shared or collaborative or that foster interdependence, occupations that are collective, commemorative, celebratory or sacred, or that foster connections to cultural traditions, occupations that derive their meaning from the context or season within which they are enacted, occupations undertaken with the purpose of honoring ancestors, spiritual traditions, and the natural world, or that are motivated by a desire to care for the land and oceans with which all of humanity is interconnected. But the importance of triangulating our theory lies not just in what might otherwise be missed, but what in, in what might otherwise be taken for granted. <clears throat> Sometimes we only become aware of the common sense ways in which we interpret, live in, and understand the world when we are confronted with the common sense ways in which others interpret, live in, and understand the world. A different vantage point can reveal what has previously been assumed or taken for granted and can enable us to recognize that what we regard as common sense is not common to everyone, but is instead unique, partial, and culturally situated. Many occupational therapists working in the Global South have resisted the colonial imposition of Western ideas, developing critical approaches to occupational therapy that recognize the historical, ideological, social, cultural, economic, and political parameters that shape people's occupational lives, and challenging the relevance of conceptual theories and models of occupation that have arisen within privileged Anglophone Western urban contexts. This is of enormous importance because occupational therapy interventions informed by irrelevant theories are likely to be experienced by clients as irrelevant inappropriate and oppressive. Moreover, post-colonial critics contend that presenting a dominant group's perspectives as universally valid for everyone is an assertion of colonial power. European colonialism has left its mark on 85% of the world, and theorists advance this colonial project when Western ideas are exported without amendment to the majority world, without consideration of their relevance or utility, leading Gerlach to claim that the occupational therapy profession's ethnocentricity appears remarkably resilient 
as Western assumptions, values, and worldviews are perpetuated in largely subtle and silent ways. Regardless of our intent, occupational therapists support and sustain theoretical imperialism, intellectual colonialism, and racism when theories, assessments, interventions, outcome measures, and models of practice that are informed by Western, culturally specific assumptions about what is valuable, desirable, and good are promoted and applied in contexts that are politically, culturally, economically, and socially dissimilar. That this is probably both naive and unintentional does not lessen any profoundly detrimental effects. It is sometimes difficult to envision the harm that might be caused by irrelevant theories. So perhaps it's helpful instead to consider the harm caused by relevant practices. In the recent past, some well-intended occupational therapists in urban areas of the global north sent obsolete second-hand wheelchairs to economically deprived areas of the majority world for distribution to disabled people living in conditions of extreme poverty, usually in rural areas. The gesture was undoubtedly sincere, but the wheelchairs were not adaptable to match individual needs were poorly suited to regions lacking paved roads and susceptible to climatic extremes. And when problems arose, the chairs could not be repaired due to exorbitant costs and the lack of replacement parts. In addition, this practice disrupted the production of locally made wheelchairs by local craftsmen, many of whom were also disabled and whose options for alternative employment were already severely limited. The inapplicability of a solution relevant in one global context being uncritically imposed in another very different global context provides a practical example of the necessity of critical thought. Sadly, our profession has many examples of this imperialistic, naive, and potentially harmful approach to practice. For example, the most widely used occupational therapy assessments attribute higher scores for accomplishing self-care activities alone than when using technical aids, and higher scores when using technical aids than when accepting help from another person. Clearly, these assessments, which are embedded within specific Western neoliberal norms about what is valuable and desirable, may have little relevance to people who have different worldviews, values, and priorities. Using these forms of assessment may therefore be culturally unsafe and may violate the principle of client-centered practice. And of course, client-centered practice is another construct underpinned by specific Western assumptions with little effort to critically appraise its relevance and applicability within majority world contexts. Our current standardized forms of assessment are not value neutral. Occupational therapists in Canada have explored how the play of indigenous children is shaped by colonial, historical, political, and socioeconomic structures, and have noted that assumptions about what constitute normal play are informed by white, middle-class, urban perspectives. And they have concluded that using occupational therapy assessments that are grounded in these perspectives may lead indigenous children to be classified as abnormal. Moreover, assessments of self-care abilities are of little value unless accompanied by assessments of capabilities, whether people have the opportunities to use their abilities to do what they value doing. Yet despite a burgeoning fascination among occupational therapists, 
with assessing the minutiae of individuals' physical and cognitive functions. Little attention has been given to assessment of the occupational possibilities offered or obstructed by the environment. This preoccupation with individual abilities and lack of attention to the factors constraining the exercise of those abilities reflects a broad neglect within occupational therapy research and theory. Critics contend that only the privileged can indulge in theory that minimizes oppressive economic, cultural, religious, social, political, legal, and policy constraints on people's lives. This indulgence has effectively diverted occupational therapists' attention from inequities stemming from racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, patriarchy, and caste, and from social determinants such as poverty, vulnerability to disease, exposure to violence, unemployment, unstable housing, and inequitable access to education, literacy, information technology, and transportation. These factors, which often intersect, are a consequence of soaring levels of global inequality that create inequitable occupational choices and opportunities and exert a noxious impact on human health and well-being. Occupational therapies, assumptions and theories inform our practices. So if our practices are to be relevant and culturally safe, our assumptions and theories must also be relevant and culturally safe. This does not require us to discard the important Eurocentric knowledge that has dominated our profession to date, but to acknowledge the imperative to include this within a much more inclusive landscape of global knowledges and ideas. Moreover, if the ideas of Western theorists are going to be exported to other global places, there is a clear need to appraise critically the relevance of what is being exported. The Kenyan post-colonial thinker Ngugi Wa Thiongo challenges us to consider the far-reaching impact of imposing Western ideas and programs on the world beyond the geographical, cultural, and class borders of dominant Western theorists. Ngugi claims that the communication of ideas can be effective tools of imperialism and advanced the idea of decolonizing the mind as a way of questioning the habitual ways of thinking we have been taught to take for granted and of resisting the colonial domination of our mental universes. If, as an international occupational therapy profession, we acknowledge the far-reaching and potentially negative impact of imposing hegemonic Western ideas and programs on the world beyond the geographical, cultural, and class borders of dominant Western theorists. If we understand the importance of decolonizing our minds and questioning the habitual ways of thinking that occupational therapists have been taught to accept, and if we recognize the imperative of triangulating the knowledges derived from diverse perspectives, we shall need to begin from a position of cultural humility. Aspirations towards cultural humility require us to develop a critical consciousness of our own assumptions, beliefs, values, and biases to understand how our own perspectives may differ from those of other people, and to acknowledge the unearned advantages, privileges, and power that may derive from multiple dimensions of our own particular social positions. Cultural humility provides a starting point for a respectful exploration of the perspectives, priorities, and values of cultural others and thus a starting point for building respectful, culturally inclusive, relevant, and effective occupational therapy theories and practices. 
Indeed, cultural humility helps us to recognize that our profession's diversity constitutes strength from which to build, not an obstacle or an inconvenience. It is self-evident that our occupational therapy theories need to incorporate multiple worldviews and values if they are to be relevant and inclusive rather than irrelevant, ethnocentric, and potentially culturally unsafe. And cultural humility will assist in decolonizing our minds and helping us to be open to the perspectives and knowledge of cultural others. Writing from Brazil, Calejo observed that the contemporary history of occupational therapy has witnessed the North and the West being positioned or positioning themselves both as the source of inspiration and provider of guidance or assistance for the South and the East. It should be obvious that one tiny minority of the global population does not enjoy a monopoly on wisdom. Moreover, it is not enough to add new perspectives to reinforce existing theories without first exposing, exploring, critiquing and challenging the assumptions and perspectives that have traditionally dominated our international discourse. If our profession is to demonstrate its international relevance and potential contribution to society, we surely have no choice but to face the challenges of doing theory in a globally inclusive way. But what is the contribution to society that our profession aspires to make? The World Federation of Occupational Therapists has stated clearly and unequivocally that occupational therapy's contribution to the global health of society and individuals is by enabling the right to engage in meaningful purposeful occupations, irrespective of medical diagnosis, social stigma, or prejudice. It is notable that WFOT does not assert the occupational therapy profession's global contribution as being the enablement of self-care, productive, and leisure occupations, nor as the maximization of human function or independence, but is enablement of the right to occupational participation. And our World Federation has gone further, reinforcing the core principle of human rights, that human rights are universal, that all people have equal rights, and by affirming that all persons, by virtue of being human, have the right to occupational opportunities necessary to meet human needs, access human rights, and maintain health, and declaring our profession's commitment to ensuring equitable opportunities for participation in occupation, regardless of difference. If the international occupational therapy profession is to be positioned to fulfill the visionary mandate we have established for ourselves, we shall need to draw theoretical and practical wisdom and knowledge from all our diverse membership, and not solely those located in the global north. We shall need to focus clearly on occupational rights and on capabilities, people's opportunities to do what they have the abilities to do, and to employ theoretical models, forms of assessment, interventions, and outcome measures that identify and address the inequitable structures that constrain the capabilities and occupational rights, not solely of individual disabled people, but of entire disadvantaged communities. And this is my challenge to researchers, clinicians, educators, and leaders to aspire beyond modifying individuals' abilities, to expand our profession's focus and relevance, and to address the factors that so inequitably constrain people's opportunities to use their abilities, 
by enlarging the possible occupational choices people have the real opportunity to make. Our national occupational therapy associations should clearly be at the forefront of this important work and ought also to exert sustained efforts to increase diversity within their own memberships to reflect the diversity within their nations. <clears throat> On the final day of a World Occupational Therapy Congress that has showcased so many inspiring and innovative ideas from so many different places, I wish to conclude by sharing with you my hope and belief that the international occupational therapy profession can be positioned to have a relevant and significant global impact by building from the strength that is our diversity and working to ensure that all people, regardless of difference, have the capabilities, both the abilities and the opportunities, to engage in occupations that contribute to their own well-being and the well-being of their communities, as is their right. Thank you.